It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going directly to heaven. We were all going directly the other way. So begins Charles Dickens' classic book, A Tale of Two Cities. Set in England and France during the French Revolution, Dickens' story relates how the same events tell two different stories based on the perspective from which they are seen. The story follows the lives of two men as they intertwine during this tumultuous time in world history. This morning, I want us to look at two other cities. And though these cities have the same name and even occupy the same space and time, they are as far apart as two places can be. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word. And and Lord, as we open it up this morning, Lord, I pray that you would teach us, that you would help us to understand the, the message that you have for us this morning. Lord, this is your word. <clears throat> it's not mine. And so, Father, I pray that, that you would speak and that I would get out of the way and your message would come through loud and clear. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds to hear from you this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're going to be looking at a very familiar passage. It is Palm Sunday, after all. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. If you're using one of the Black Pew Bibles, you're going to find it on page 1040. A little background here. Jesus has been teaching, he's been preaching. But for about three and a half years now, his disciples have been traveling with him throughout Israel, throughout Galilee. They've seen him perform countless miracles. They've seen the crowds that gathered wherever Jesus went as he ministered to people, as he taught them the word of God with an authority that no one else had. But now, Jesus and his disciples are heading up to Jerusalem. To celebrate the Passover. Jesus knows that it's going to be his final Passover with his disciples. And as they've been traveling, he's been trying to prepare them for what was going to happen. He was telling them that he was going to be handed over to the Gentiles. He was going to be mocked and insulted and spit upon and flogged and killed. And in spite of this, the disciples still did not understand what was going to happen. And the time had come to make the final approach up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was crowded. People had been pouring in from all over the countryside to celebrate the greatest of the Jewish feasts, the Passover. The celebration of God's deliverance of the Israelites from the death and destruction of Egypt. The celebration of the angel of death passing over them as it destroyed the firstborn of every family in the land that had not covered their doorposts with blood. The celebration of their release from the bondage of slavery in in Egypt. And most importantly, it reminded the Jews that no matter who might be in power, that God had not forgotten them. And they were his chosen people. God wasn't through with them yet. Upward of a million people crowded into the area around Jerusalem at this time of year. And it stretched the capabilities of the city to cope with the massive crowds almost to the breaking point. 
Thankfully, the crowds were, by and large, peaceful. Otherwise, the Romans would be forced to exert their muscles in ways that no one wanted to contemplate in order to maintain the peace. Now, Jerusalem itself sat on a hill. The approach to the city began at Jericho and went past the small towns of, of Bethphage and, and Bethany, the home of Mary and Martha and the miraculous resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus was on the last leg of his journey. He's on his way to Jerusalem for the last time as we pick up the story, as we see the city on a hill. Verses 28 through 40, Luke 19. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going, <clears throat> going up to Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me. As he approached, Beth, approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices <coughs> for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The triumphal entry. Right? That's what we usually call this scene. There are people everywhere. A grand procession, the entry into Jerusalem of their new king. People shouting and, and praising God. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. I mean, it's glorious, isn't it? Can't you just hear it? Can't you just imagine it? This great throng of pilgrims to Jerusalem turned out some rejoicing. Some were incredulous. And some, they were just along for the party. That's how we see it in our mind's eye, right? Well, truthfully, truthfully, the whole thing started much more simply. Luke tells us that as Jesus approached the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples into the village, I mean, in, into a nearby village to find a cult. And that, you know, that sounds kind of strange to us. You know, why would he go and get this cult? This cult? But it's, it, it, as unusual as it sounds to us, it was a very normal thing back then. Jesus was arranging transportation for himself. It was like, be like a, uh, sending an assistant to go uh, arrange a cab to get to the airport. But the ride that Jesus was arranging wasn't just any ride. Like everything in Jesus' ministry, nothing was left to chance. There was a purpose for everything. The disciples were to find a particular ride for Jesus, a colt that would be tied up just inside the city, just where they entered, one that had never been ridden. Now, I've seen a lot of movies and TV shows about cowboys, right? And the fact that the colt had never been ridden throws up this huge red flag in my mind. You don't just walk up to some animal that has never been uh, saddled, jump on it, and then start riding it down the street. Right? That, my friends, is a recipe for disaster. You're more likely to end up sprawled face down on the street than riding down it on the donkey. But since Luke makes a point to tell us this, 
that the colt had never been ridden, it must be significant. In fact, this is in keeping with a Jewish thought of divine things. To the Jewish mind, once something has been used for some uh, mundane purpose, it was no longer fit to be used for divine duty. I mean, we see that type of thinking in 1 Samuel 6, where the Philistines are trying to return the, the Ark of the Covenant to the Jews. And now then, they write, now then, get a new cart ready and two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Take the Ark of the Lord and put it on the cart. We see it in 2 Samuel 6, as David begins to bring the Ark into Jerusalem. They set the Ark of God on a new cart. Further, the red heifer of Numbers was to be without defect or blemish and never to have been under a yoke. The point is that this was no regular donkey. It was to be a donkey fit for a divine purpose. You know, at this point, everything was pretty low-key. The disciples went. They found the donkey just like Jesus told them they would. And as they untied the colt, the animal's owner saw them doing that. And they asked him what they were doing. Uh-oh. It wasn't so much that they were taking one of the donkeys. It was normal, as I said, to have these animals available to hire, to rent out for people to ride. The issue was the animal itself. Remember, this is a colt. This is a young animal that had never been ridden. It's hardly the type of animal that anyone would want to ride. But the disciples did just as Jesus uh, instructed them, and the owners let the animal go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their outer cloaks on it, and then they set Jesus up on this donkey. In this, we see the response of the disciples to all of this. You know, after nearly three years or three years of following Jesus, the disciples were willing to follow his instructions even when they didn't make any sense to them. The things that they'd seen had prepared them to trust what Jesus said. It's not that they fully understood what was going on. In fact, John tells us that they didn't understand most of what was going on until after the resurrection. Even so, the fact remains that they followed Jesus' instruction. You know, that's the proper response. That's the proper response to instructions from the Lord. He's the one who knows what's happening, not us. We see through limited eyes. We see with a limited perspective. He, he sees through eyes that see all of time and all of space all at once. He's the one who knows everything that's going on. So like the disciples there with Jesus that day, we must be prepared to follow Jesus even when it doesn't make sense to us. And that can be difficult at times. I mean, I remember when God began calling me to go to seminary, I, I was in a good place already. You know, I owned a good company. I employed a bunch of people. I was enjoying what I was doing. <clears throat> but God had a different plan. You know, most people would think that I was crazy leaving all of that behind to go into the ministry. And I'm not going to lie to you. It was a very difficult decision for me to make. But I truly believe that God knows what's best, not me. And so here I am, following his lead the best I can. And I would implore you to do the same. After bringing the donkey back to Jesus, the disciples placed their coats on the animal. They were preparing a saddle for Jesus to sit on. They were preparing a seat for the king. And so must we. We must continue to prepare our hearts 
as Jesus reigns there. The Bible says that when we're saved, we are new creations. And that's absolutely true. But there's still a lot of cleaning out of the storeroom that needs to go on. Paul tells us that we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. As the Holy Spirit points out areas in your life that need to change, you know, we need to turn those areas over to God so that we continue to prepare our hearts for His reign in our life. We never need to worry that we're going to be abandoned by Christ. I mean, our salvation is eternal, but we must work to prepare the seat that Christ occupies at the center of our life. And then as the disciples lift Jesus up onto the donkey, they're lifting the king up to be seen by the world. As a, the song lyrics go, we want to see Jesus high and lifted up, right? Like the disciples with Jesus that day, we need to lift Jesus up for the world to see. And so we see the response of the disciples that day. They were prepared to follow Jesus. They were prepared for him to be seated at the place of authority. They lifted him up to be seen by the world. But that was just one set of responses that Luke registered that day. So let's look at the response of the people. In verses 36 through 38, we discover what happens as Jesus continues toward Jerusalem. The people who are coming up to Jerusalem hear that Jesus is coming. Probably some who were ahead turned back to meet him. John tells us that the crowd that was around when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead kept spreading the word that he was coming. I mean, it was big news that Jesus was coming. Many in the crowd had heard about Jesus' teaching and many had seen or heard about the amazing things that he had done throughout the countryside over the past couple of years. And the crowd continued to grow. And the people spread their coats on the ground in front of the cult, in front of Jesus. And it was their version of what we would call a red carpet greeting today. And as the crowd grew, it became louder, and the buzz began to grow. More and more people showed up. I mean, this was a major event. Jesus was coming. He's coming to Jerusalem. And the entourage crested the, 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 the top of the Mount of Olives, and then the whole crowd breaks out in praise to God. Luke tells us they began joyfully to praise God for all the miracles that they had seen. Louder and louder they sang. They sang scripture. Psalm 118, 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And the chants became more vigorous as the crowd grew. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The heavenly refrain that filled the skies at his birth now echoes in the street as he approaches the city. But why? Why were the people shouting? What was the cause of this great outpouring of emotion? I mean, certainly part of the response was based on what Jesus had been doing. Luke tells us that the people were praising God because of the miracles that they had seen. In other words, at least part of the crowd's reaction was in response to the things that Jesus had done. He had healed some of the sick. He had fed the hungry. He had cared for the physical needs of the people in the area. That's why they were celebrating. If Jesus could do something for those people, he can do something for me. Now, there's nothing wrong with celebrating what God does. I mean, it should be celebrated. 
But when that's the entire basis for the celebration, the celebration becomes selfish. The celebration is no longer about the goodness of God. Instead, it's about what God can do for me. No matter how enthusiastic, no matter how heartfelt the response of the world to God's goodness seems to be, we need to recognize that the response of the world to the approach of God is often selfish. You see, the world isn't looking for God to glorify himself through his work. The world is looking for God to satisfy them. And that leads to the second response of the people that day. The crowd that was so jubilantly celebrating the coming of Jesus to Jerusalem, this crowd that couldn't wait to extol the virtues of Jesus' miracles, this crowd that apparently desired nothing less than for Jesus to be crowned King of Israel, is the same crowd that five short days later would be crying, Crucify Him. You see, Jesus didn't live up to their expectations. Instead of entering into Jerusalem and declaring himself to be king, instead of leading a revolt of the people to take back their country from the Romans, this man, this Jesus, got himself arrested and beaten. What, what kind of king is that? And, and the truth is, it seemed like he didn't even want to be their king. And if that was the case, well, they'll just wait for the next guy. We need to recognize that the response of the world to the approach of God is fickle and short-lived. You see, when God doesn't produce what they want, they'll turn and they will walk away. There was one more group there that day. One other constituency that needs to be heard from. Verses 39 and 40 tell us about the response of the authorities to the approach of Jesus. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. The Pharisees had seen and heard enough. They knew enough to recognize the messianic implications of the people's cries. I mean, they, of all people, understood the ramifications that would be unleashed against the people if this demonstration continued. And they didn't want anything to do with it. As the crowd grew louder and louder, the Pharisees that were along the road demanded that Jesus do something before the mob caused problems with the Romans. Tensions were running high enough already as the city was bursting at the seams with all of the visitors. It wouldn't take much for the Romans to become overly concerned with the growing chaos and begin to clamp down on any type of exuberant expression. And that would begin a cycle that could very easily spin out of control, with the result being a lockdown where deeper antagonism between the Jews and the Romans would fester. Nothing good could come from this celebration. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Quiet them down. Don't you know what's at stake here? The tension between Jesus and the Pharisees had always been present. But so far, things have been kept among the Jews, and the Pharisees wanted to keep it that way. See, because if the Romans got involved, then they would demand that some things be changed. If the Pharisees couldn't keep the crowds under control, then the Romans would have no need for them. The people crying out that a new king had come into the city certainly wouldn't help the Pharisees' cause at all. The last thing that they wanted was for the Romans to think that they had anything to do with this. The Romans would certainly disband them. 
And the Pharisees would cease to exert the power that they had over the people. And so, they demanded that Jesus do something to quiet the crowd. When you think about it, though, that's really a very strange response from the Pharisees. If the truth be told, the Pharisees would love to see a new Jewish king. They dream of the day that Israel would throw off the oppression of the Romans and once again establish itself as the world power. But they're unwilling to take the chance right now. Something could go wrong. I mean, clearly, if this Jesus guy were to be successful, then the Pharisees would be cut out of the new power structure. There certainly didn't seem to be any love lost between Jesus and the Pharisees. I mean, he'd already called them greedy hypocrites, unjust, unloving, self-important, and unclean. So sadly, the Pharisees reject Jesus once again. And they demand that he quiet the crowd. And through through this, we come to understand that human authority fears the loss power. We see the same thing happening today. One of the leading causes of the atrocities that you see with dictators all over the world is their fear of being toppled. They'll destroy large parts of their own countrymen if they feel threatened. Power is an intoxicating thing. We see the same thing in our nation today. Many people, many leaders, fear losing control of the people. And so they try to push Jesus off to the side. They try to silence anyone who dares to worship him or to praise him publicly. But Jesus once again put things in perspective. I tell you, he said, if the people keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As much as the Pharisees would have that crowd silenced, this cannot happen. A movement of God was taking place before their very eyes. As much authority as they believed that they had, Jesus let them know in no uncertain terms that they were powerless before God. If the human voices could be stilled, inanimate creation would continue to cry out to praise the holy God. Here Jesus helps us to understand that human desire can never triumph over the praise of God. In Psalm 19, we read, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. If we don't proclaim the glory of God, The proclamation doesn't stop. All of creation cries out, glory to God. Glory in the highest. Praise to the creator and to the perfecter of our faith. From everlasting to everlasting, our God reigns. We've seen a couple of responses. We've seen the response of the people who dwelt in the first city. The city on a hill. The city that held out so much hope. So now we move on to the second of the two cities. The city of doom. Verses 41 through 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. 
They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You know, there's something very interesting about Luke's uh, recounting of the trial, 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 the triumphant entry that's often overlooked. There is no triumphal entry. Luke never has the procession enter into Jerusalem. Eventually, Jesus is seen in the temple, but nowhere in the procession of the people, the disciples, the donkey, all of that stuff, nowhere in this magnificent parade do we find Jesus entering that great city. He's always approaching, never reaching. And that's significant. In Luke's narrative, the city never accepts their king. Instead, we find Jesus on the hill outside of Jerusalem, looking up at that glorious city, the home of the temple of God, and he's weeping. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. The Greek word used here is not merely just crying. He's not just shedding some tears over Jerusalem. It's more along the lines of wailing. We find the same word in Matthew 2, 18, after Herod had killed all the boys under two years of age, with Rachel weeping for her children. In Matthew 26, 75, where we find Peter weeping bitterly after denying Jesus three times. Luke 7, where the sinful woman was weeping and washing Jesus' feet with her tears. And we see it again in John, in, uh, John 20, where Mary Magdalene stood outside the empty tomb, weeping, when she thought that someone had stolen Jesus' body. And then we see it in Revelation chapter 5, as John wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. It's just not, it's not just tears that, that Jesus was shedding. There is this inner anguish that, that's pushing, that it's pushing Jesus to the point of crying out loud, deep in sorrow. And he cries out for the city. He cries out for the people of the city. He cries out because of the destruction that he knows is coming. And like Jesus, we need to recognize that the world is headed for destruction. And it should cause us to cry out in anguish. There was still, there was still a procession going on here. It's not like everything stopped and Jesus continued on by himself. But even while those around him continued to cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus looks up to the city and weeps. And that's quite a contrast. See, Jesus sees through all of this bustling activity, these huge crowds, the great joy that's being expressed around him, and he sees deep into the heart of the city deep into the souls of the leadership of the Jews, past the joy around him, and into the rejection. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. It's a lament. Jerusalem, the city whose very name means peace, had missed the opportunity for true peace. The rejection of the Lord is going to lead to the destruction of her wall. More than that, it's going to lead to her total destruction. Not one stone will be left upon another. 
So Jesus wept. The destruction of the city is ensured by their rejection of the Lord. There's no way around it. The justice of God necessitates it. But at the same time, the tenderness of the Lord laments it. The Bible tells us that the Lord does not want anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. But there comes a time, there comes a time when the rejection of the Lord will lead to destruction. And this was Jerusalem's time. Jerusalem had her chance, but she rejected her Lord. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I long to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look, your home is left to you desolate. Time and time again, Jerusalem refused the advances of the Lord. Time and time again, the Jews were offered the salvation of their king. But now Jerusalem's destruction was sealed. In the same way, there will come a point when an individual's refusal to accept Jesus as their Savior will seal their destruction as well. We don't know when that will be. Only God knows that. And so we must not let the refusal of the gospel spell the end of our invitation. We must continue to offer salvation even to those who refuse it. We must continue to offer salvation even to those who refuse it. This week, this week we will celebrate the death of Jesus on Friday. It seems like such an odd thing to celebrate someone's death especially a death that is so violent and vicious. But it's that death that paid the price for our sin. It's that death that purchased our pardon. Jesus was calling and is calling himself, calling us to himself, offering himself as the payment for our sins. You know, we can never make that payment ourselves because our sin is separated us from God, and has doomed us to death. But Jesus paid the price by giving himself as a sacrifice for each one of us. Jesus is calling you to eternal life with him. Will you reject him again? You see, we don't know when our time will be. The only thing we know for certain is that without the Lord, we are without hope. As much as Jesus desires for all to come to faith, there is a time when he will be forced to act as judge. I'm reminded that even though a prisoner may have been a friend of the judge, and time and time again the judge begged for his friend to repent and turn from his ways, there will come a day when justice will demand that the judge impose the sentence that condemns their friend. The sentence is necessary. The prisoner shows no remorse. But it's a judge who feels the pain far more than the convicted felon being let off to die. Come to Jesus now before the destruction occurs. Do not miss the time of Jesus' coming to you. You know, it's a paradox of the Christian faith that Palm Sunday, a time that should be so full of joy, should instead be filled with such grief. 
But, but I think that this teaches us something about our, what our response to the world should be. Like Jesus, we need to see beyond the outer trappings of the world around us to the destruction that lies ahead for everyone who does not know the deliverance of Christ. We need to weep. We need to cry out, to, to feel with our whole being the despair that will overtake the people of the world when they realize that it's too late. That they've missed their opportunity for salvation. That they're doomed to destruction because they, like Jerusalem, have missed the day of their visitation. You know, the climax of a tale of two cities comes as the Englishman Sidney Carton trades places with the Frenchman Evremond and is executed in his place. And we hear his dying words echo through the years since then. He said, it is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, than that he laid down his life for his friend. As we celebrate Palm Sunday, we see Jesus preparing to do just that. He gave his life so that we can have eternal life. As Christians, will we do the same? Will we willingly lay down our lives to save those who are lost? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray. Lord, we do pray for the people that live around this church, in this city, in this nation, in the world who do not know you. Oh Lord, there may be great rejoicing. There can be parties everywhere. But Lord, all of those things are temporary. Lord, the only thing that matters is life in you. So, Father, I, I, I pray, Lord, that you would be working in people's hearts. That you would work in the hearts of the people who do not know you. <clears throat> Father, to change them, to prepare them to hear the gospel. So that when they hear it, Lord, they might come to faith. Father, be working in our hearts to change us. To make us bold about sharing our faith. Help us to see people the way that you do, Lord, as Jesus did coming up to Jerusalem as he wept because he knew what was coming for them. Lord, help us to, to, to know that kind of anguish for a dying world. And Father, help us to reach out. Help us to, to offer the gift of salvation to everyone that we meet. Father, I pray this week that you would give us divine appointments, Lord. People who are waiting to hear the gospel. And Lord, help us not to walk by them. Oh, Father, open our hearts, open our eyes, open our mouths that many might come to faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, that's their only hope. It's our only hope. But Father, we trust you. Father, we, we, we rely on you to give us the strength that we need. To give us the excitement that we need to be able to share this gift. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the blessings that, that are coming our way. We thank you for the blessings, Lord, that you are going to pour out on this world. Lord, we pray that you would use us to glorify yourself. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.